Wonderful. We are live. Do me a favor, everyone. If there's any issues with sound or video stream, please let me know in the chat comments. I want to get started right away here. It's Saturday. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our special educational symposium sponsored by Arinia Pharmaceuticals. My name is Kelly and I'm the creator and executive director of the Portland based nonprofit more than lupus and if you are unfamiliar with more than lupus we are a multi-ethnic multi-generational and international lupus community designed by lupus patients to connect and to grow and to inspire each other throughout the peaks and the valleys of our lupus journeys and i say are because i have lived with systemic lupus and multiple lupus overlap conditions since the age of 11. I was a pediatric patient. Now, we believe every person living with lupus, no matter their background, should be treated with equity, uh, dignity, and taken seriously. So it's our mission here at More Than Lupus that patients feel heard, that they feel seen, and they feel valued. It is also our plan of action here to continue to spotlight minority populations disproportionately impacted and infected, affected by lupus and lupus nephritis. So today, our event will spotlight the unique challenges of people living with lupus and lupus nephritis. And we hope that the information provided today can be used as a resource that hopefully propels you to have an open and honest conversation with your doctors about ways that you can become more engaged with your kidney health and be vigilant if ever lupus nephritis bubbles to the surface. Uh, by the way, please make sure that you share this live event on your Facebook page so that people can get connected to a community of support and have access to some incredible information and resources that will be shared today. Also, anyone who shares this and writes shared in their comments will be entered to win a lupus awareness swag bag. So that's exciting too, with some added goodies from our walk that we had last week. Uh, before I go any further, please allow me to give you a brief disclaimer. Please understand that the opinions shared today are purely for informational purposes and do not replace the medical advice and or opinions of your doctors. If you are experiencing lupus, lupus nephritis, or lupus overlap symptoms, it is important for you to follow up with your doctor and to seek the treatment that is best for you. Our panelists are qualified professionals. However, they are not liable for their comments since they are not acting as your personal physicians or health advocates. So it is time that we, as a patient community, delve deeper into this conversation. And I am thrilled to have Danny, Strategic Alliance Manager and Advocacy Representative for Arinia, here to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kochar. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thanks, Kelly. And good afternoon, everyone. Like uh, Kelly said, my name is Danny Martinez, and I'm the Strategic Alliance Manager with Arinia. And I'd like to thank Kelly and More Than Lupus for the opportunity to partner with them and welcome you to today's discussion. Get uncomfortable prioritizing lupus and your kidneys. As you may be aware, Arena makes a medicine for adults and lupus nephritis. However, today's presentation will not discuss any medicines and will focus on the importance of early detection through routine testing and the management of lupus nephritis. We look forward to sharing information about our medicine at a future program. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce your speaker for today's program, Dr. Tina Koshar. Dr. Koshar is an associate professor and nephrologist at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, and the medical director of the Davida Dialysis Unit in Victory Lakes, Texas. She received her Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at the Government Medical College Hospital <clears throat> in India. She completed her internal medicine residency and nephrology fellowship at the UTMB in Galveston, Texas. Dr. Koshar 
Koshar's range of practice includes general nephrology and hypertension with special interest in managing glomerular diseases. She sees patients at the nephrology ambulatory care clinics in League City and at universal hospital clinics in Galveston. She is actively engaged in medical school education and the, and the course director for the renal fluid and electrolytes course for the second year medical students. Dr. Koshar is the recipient of awards and honors, including fellows in American Society of Nephrology, American Society of Nephrology Trainee Travel Award, and Junior Teaching Award from the Government Medical College and Hospital. She is a board certified in internal medicine and nephrology. And with that, Dr. Koshar, you may begin. Thank you, Danny, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as Danny mentioned, um, I uh, take care of uh, lupus patients in the glomerular clinic, and I really enjoy uh, taking care uh, of patients uh, who have lupus and have kidney involvement from lupus. Um, and uh, over time, you know, it becomes like a long-term relationship, and I see their progress. Um, so today, I'll be talking about how to prioritize uh, lupus and your kidneys. And uh, we will look at uh, what we can do to uh, you know, help patients the most. Next slide. Next slide. And towards the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. So <clears throat> let's start with a quote from Monique. Uh, when it comes to lupus nephritis, what you don't know can hurt you. I'm hopeful that stepping into the uncomfortable spaces of lupus nephritis will be both empowering and life-changing. Next slide. So let's understand and talk about, you know, what is lupus? So lupus or SLE, it stands for systemic lupus erythematosus, or lupus for short, is a chronic, complex, and often disabling autoimmune disorder in which the immune system attacks healthy cells of the body. The inflammation caused by lupus can affect many different parts of the body, as you know, including joints, skin, brain, heart, lungs, and kidneys. When lupus affects the kidneys, it's called lupus nephritis, or you may hear uh, this being referred to as LN. And symptoms of lupus nephritis aren't always noticeable, but they are serious. So it can be a silent disease. That's why we need to create more awareness. Next slide. So let's talk about how lupus can you know, affect the, the kidneys and what do kidneys do? So your kidneys are vital organs that filter your blood by removing waste and extra water. So it does two things, you know, it removes extra fluid and it removes the toxins. And lupus nephritis is a common and serious complication of lupus that causes inflammation in the kidneys. When your kidneys cannot function properly, uh, you know, neither can many parts of the body. That's why protecting the kidneys is so important. So if the kidneys get involved, many other organs can get involved. And this can be like a multi-systemic disease. Uh, this inflammation in the kidneys may cause permanent damage. And as I mentioned, the kidneys help to remove extra fluid and clean the toxins. So when your kidneys are not functioning properly, it cannot take care of those two uh, important functions. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, um, lupus nephritis can be silent, but it's a common and serious complication of lupus. About one in two people with lupus may go on to develop lupus nephritis. So that's almost half of the people affected with lupus or SLE can develop kidney involvement. So we know it's that's, that's a big number. Um, inflammation caused by lupus nephritis can lead to permanent kidney damage and even kidney failure which may require dialysis or kidney transplant if we don't control the inflammation aggressively and treat the disease. Lupus nephritis can also lead to other serious health issues, including high blood pressure, which is also called hypertension, and an increased risk of heart attacks and stroke. Our patients who get kidney involvement are at higher, risks, uh, at higher risk of having cardiac involvement also. And that's why early diagnosis and treatment of lupus nephritis is crucial to help prevent irreversible kidney damage and other serious complications. So our goal is to control this inflammation um, in the kidneys 
uh, as early as possible, diagnose these patients early on so that we can prevent these serious complications and keep the kidney function normal or stable. Next slide. Let's now look at some uncomfortable facts and figures. Up to one in three people living with lupus nephritis may experience kidney failure. The risk of death is three times greater for people living with lupus nephritis than people with lupus without kidney involvement. So if your kidneys get involved, the risk of death goes up. And so we really need to recognize this serious complication and create awareness amongst our patients. Lupus nephritis is more common in some racial and ethnic groups compared to non-Hispanic white people. It's four times more likely for people of African and Asian descent and two times more likely for Hispanic and native uh, peoples. So again, you know, we do have to keep that in mind that some of our minority patients, um, and I take care of a lot of these patients, including Hispanic and African-Americans, um, they do have a more aggressive form of the disease or they can have a more aggressive form of the disease and it's more common. So we really need to identify this early on so we can get the best care to these patients. Um, again, uh, you know, there are steps that you can take, um, such as scheduling routine tests and asking about treatment options. So we are able to diagnose kidney involvement is in lupus early on and by something as simple as a urine test. And we'll talk about these tests in the next slide. Next slide. Okay. And before we get into that, I'm going to read another quote from Gabrielle. Uh, <clears throat> it's time to get real. Um, lupus nephritis patients have many odds against them, but we do have the power of choice and we can do our part. Next slide. So now let's talk about um, the various tests you know, that are available to you all uh, and that the physicians should be conducting early on to diagnose kidney involvement in lupus. Um, so there are three main things that we look at, uh, urine test, blood test, and in majority of the patients, we will also need what we call a kidney biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. So first, let's talk about urine tests. So they are the most common tests that you will receive. Um, rheumatologists, once they diagnose SLE or lupus, uh, will do a urine test you know, every time you go to their clinic, every three months to make sure there is no kidney involvement. And what are they looking for uh, you know, when they check your urine um, in the clinic? They're looking for protein or blood in the urine. So those are the two main things that they're looking for. And that's how we know if you have kidney involvement or not. <clears throat> so in every visit, they'll see how much protein you're spilling in the urine. That's called proteinuria. And you, you will hear that term frequently. The other thing they're looking for is blood in the urine, which is also called hematuria. So both of those indicate inflammation of the kidneys uh, from lupus. And what we're looking for, um, there should be minimal amount of protein in the urine, and we are targeting for a protein less than half a gram per day in the urine. And that's a number you all should remember. So that's how we know that um, patients are getting cured, you know, from the kidney involvement from lupus is if that protein goes down. So at every visit uh, that, you know, uh, you're at, you want to make sure you ask your nephrologist or the rheumatologist, how much protein am I spilling? And there are patients who might spill three, four, five, six grams of protein in the urine. So when we start treatment, our goal is to get these patients down to less than half a gram per day. So normal patients uh, or normal people don't spill any protein or it's usually minimal amount of protein. And so half a gram is what we're targeting for. <clears throat> Uh, the second thing we do um, is a blood test. And what are we looking for on the blood test? That's a routine test looking at your kidney function. And you all may ha have heard of the test called creatinine. Based on the creatinine on the blood test, we can estimate the level of kidney function in percentage, which is also referred to as EGFR or estimated glomerular filtration rate. And again, you may have seen that on your test results, which reports the creatinine on the blood test, and then also reports the EGFR, which is essentially your level of kidney function in percentage. And this tells us how well your kidneys are filtering blood. <clears throat> 
once we know that the kidneys are being involved by lupus, um, and how do we know that? As I just said, if you're spilling protein or blood, then the next thing we do to confirm the diagnosis is a kidney biopsy. And again, that's done, one, to confirm the diagnosis, and then second, to check the extent of the damage uh, from lupus, um, because that really helps us uh, to decide how aggressively we want to treat our patients. Because um, some patients may have extensive scarring. Uh, those patients may not be candidates for treatment. But then some patients may have very active inflammation, and we want to treat them aggressively early on. And also, lupus can affect kidneys in five to six different ways, uh, and the therapy might vary. So that's why it's also important to classify these patients so we know exactly what class um, of lupus nephritis we are dealing with. So just to summarize, so urine test looking for protein and blood, blood test looking at the creatinine and the EGFR, and a kidney biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Next slide. <clears throat> so symptoms of lupus nephritis may go unnoticed because a lot of times I get patients in my clinic and they're just surprised that, you know, they have um, kidney involvement from lupus and they're like, oh, we don't have any pain uh, because it typically doesn't give you any sort of kidney pain. Um, and that's why it's important to show up for all your appointments so that um, your rheumatologist or nephrologist can keep an eye on the urine test regularly. Once you have kidney involvement from lupus, sometimes we do these tests uh, every month. So initially to screen, we may do every three months, but once you have kidney involvement, at least for the four, six months, we may check the urine test and the blood test once a month. <clears throat> So uh, what should you be looking out for, you know, as far as symptoms are concerned? Uh, you may see um, some signs uh, and symptoms from uh, worsening kidney function, which could be swelling. You may notice some swelling of your feet, your ankles, um, that can indicate a decline in kidney function. Increase in blood pressure. Again, that's also a sign of kidneys being involved, uh, where your blood pressure can start to go up and a, a frothy or foamy urine. That's something I really tell my patients, you know, if they start to notice uh, that all of a sudden their urine is foamy and frothy, uh, they need to let us know because that can indicate protein in the urine. So again, these are important things to be looking out for. So that's something that you can notice at your end, uh, some of the symptoms, and then we at our end check your urine and blood tests. Next slide. So um, how should you prepare for your next appointment? And I think this is really important. Um, lupus or lupus nephritis, you know, it can be an overwhelming condition. Uh, it requires frequent um, uh, clinic appointments, frequent lab appointments. And uh, at times, you know, when you go in, um, you may not remember everything that you were told because there's a lot to deal with. Um, and a lot of patients that I deal with are younger patients, you know, they're teenagers or in their 20s. And they already have so much going on, you know, they're trying to figure their life out and now they have to uh, deal with, you know, this serious um, complication of lupus uh, called lupus nephritis. So a lot of times I encourage my patients, you know, to bring a friend or a family member if possible, if not, uh, make sure they always, you know, bring a diary uh, and write down their questions and then also write down what we are telling them and bring that to each appointment so they can remember and follow like a trend. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I tell them to write down your symptoms over time and any change, any changes to your symptoms between appointments. Um, also, I encourage my patients to remember, you know, their protein levels in the urine. And the fact that, you know, they should be asking the nephrologist at each visit, oh, you know, how much am I spilling now? Because we are aiming for less than half a gram per day. Um, that's how the patients can also keep a track of their progress. <clears throat> so write down that creatinine number, write down that EGFR and that protein level. Um, and again, as I said, um, that protein in the urine, you know, is, is crucial uh, for us physicians to see how the kidneys are responding. Because the faster we lower that protein in the urine, uh, the better long-term, you know, survival of the kidneys. 
again, keep track of your medical appointments. Um, I mentioned earlier, take a friend or a family member to your appointment if possible. Um, and then also at each visit, I do encourage my patients to bring all their medicines because, um, you know, almost at every visit or every other visit, we end up making those adjustments because uh, you know, there can be multiple changes based on how your kidney function is doing, how much protein you're spilling. Um, so there can be changes with the with the doses, you know, almost every month or every other month, uh, or we may be adding new medications. So always bring your medications with you and any supplements you may be taking. Uh, again, the key is to be your own health advocate and ask questions that you may have. And I tell my patients, you know, um, do not hesitate from asking questions and uh, don't ever think that, oh, you know, you cannot ask all these questions or if this is a silly question, you know, this is your health, uh, you know, that we are talking about. And the faster we get you into remission, you know, the better, uh, because if there are delays in diagnosis or if there are delays in therapy, uh, at times, you know, it can cause irreversible damage and our patients can end up on dialysis. So, which is something, you know, we don't want. Uh, and so it's really important to ask you know, any question you have and ask those questions multiple times if you need to, because we understand that this is a disease affecting young patients and we need to get this under control. Um, and yes, you know, please do make a list of your questions uh, before every appointment. Um, and, uh, you know, I tell my patients to reach out, you know, if they forget something and, um, you know, it happens and it's, you know, we're all human and here you all are dealing with a serious disease. So um, absolutely, you know, write your questions ahead of time. Okay, and next slide. So I think we are almost at the end uh, of our presentation. Uh, and some of you may know that, you know, Tony Braxton has also partnered with Arinia uh, to create uh, more awareness uh, uh, for, you know, lupus and lupus nephritis. Uh, she does have SLE, but not kidney involvement. Uh, so uh, you can, you know, read her full story uh, if you scan the barcode here, which is quite fascinating. So again, our goal is to, you know, make more and more patients and their family members understand, you know, that this is a serious complication and we need to treat this condition aggressively uh, and as early as possible. Next slide. And I think we are coming to the end of the presentation. Again, managing lupus nephritis is hard, but it's worth it. So at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions that you all may have um, and any other uh, stories, any comments anyone may have for us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kuchara. This was really informative. And I, I love having this perspective because oftentimes we have rheumatologists on with us. So this is really fascinating. And on that line, as you were speaking, I was thinking uh, a good question that many people might be wondering is at what point do these patients come to see you? Because I know that rheumatologists they often have this umbrella of different aspects of lupus that they treat. And at one point, usually does a patient get um, kind of introduced to a nephrologist? That's a great there. question. Yes, and a very important question. So uh, the rheumatologists, you know, usually have a very low threshold of referring patients to a nephrologist when they see any level of protein being spilled in the urine. So. Uh, at least at my program, I work very closely with our rheumatologists. So at any point, if they start seeing any level of protein, and this should be the case, uh, you know, across, you know, uh, the community and all the other physicians, because um, a lot of times it will be the primary care physician or the rheumatologist who will see these patients first. Um, and they're the ones who are screening by doing a urine test, what we call a urinalysis. So at any point, if there's any protein uh, being spilled in the urine, that's when they should be referred to a nephrologist. And if your rheumatologist or your primary care physician is telling you that, oh, I'm seeing some protein in the urine, uh, and if they're not referring you to a nephrologist, you should uh, ask them to get referred to a nephrologist because, um, you know, for some community physicians or a primary care physician, half a gram of protein may not mean much. But for us, you know, even half a gram, you know, if it's already starting to, you know, appear in the urine is significant. And we want to start doing more tests at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
And I know that you spoke about the protein spill. This is kind of a language that we learn in the lupus realm as patients. You start to understand uh, words like protein spill, like bond ratio, like EGFR, you know, all these yeah. All this lingo starts to become kind of part of your vocabulary. Right. Uh, you mentioned blood and protein spilling mm -hmm. the urine. Is there ever times where you might have just one or the other? Mm -hmm. I know some of us who are watching probably said, well, I had blood in my urine and it wasn't a thing until I had blood and protein or right. I had protein but no blood. Uh, can you just kind of fill us in a little bit about that? Absolutely. Again, a very important question. So uh, almost 100% of the patients with kidney involvement from lupus will have protein in the urine. Mm -hmm. So every patient uh, with kidney involvement in lupus will have protein being spilled in the urine. Now, again, blood is plus minus. You may or may not have blood. So there are different classes, as I had briefly mentioned earlier, of lupus nephritis. Um, you know, we have it goes from classes, you know, one through six. And you will hear that, you know, when you get a kidney biopsy, oh, you have class three, you have class four, or you have class five. Those are our most three common classes. <clears throat> so class five typically is the one that may not have any blood in the urine, but you can still have lupus nephritis. Yes, yeah, so there is one class of uh, lupus nephritis, which may not have blood. So again, you always have protein, you may or may not have blood in the urine. Right. Um, right. So if you have no protein in the urine, only blood, a lot of time, times that indicates a minor kidney involvement, you know, or not as significant. And those patients typically we do not treat and we typically mm -hmm. do not biopsy. And the rheumatologists are also aware of that. So if they're only seeing blood, they may not refer them to a nephrologist, which is okay. But in our program, you know, we run a lupus clinic. So, uh, you know, the rheumatologist, even if they see blood, they will send them to me just to make sure, you know, they're not missing anything and, you know, which is actually okay. Uh, but yes, protein, you will always have blood is plus minus. Right. And sometimes blood could be from other things like, you know, a kidney stone or an infection mm -hmm. that may not be related to nephritis. Yes. So blood in the urine, the two the two or three more common causes, as you mentioned, a UTI, a urinary tract infection, kidney stones are the are the more common ones. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Interesting. Okay, so I a question that was pre-submitted, and I we have a couple of questions that are here live that I want to make sure we have time to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, but with lupus, we are often told we have nephritis and chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be confusing because they almost seem interchangeable. Can you kind of tell us the difference between lupus nephritis and chronic kidney disease? Absolutely. So again, not every lupus patient will have worsening of kidney function. If we catch kidney involvement early, uh, patients may have normal kidney function. And how do we know that? We know that by EGFR. So if your EGFR is above you know, 90% or 100%, that's normal or near normal. Um, but then there are some patients uh, who we may diagnose late or who may have more aggressive form of the disease. And those patients, um, even if we start them on therapy, may not recover all the way. And then those are the ones, you know, if the kidney function does not recover all the way, may go on to develop what's called CKD or chronic kidney disease, where their kidney function declines, you know, below 60% uh, or, you know, somewhere in that range. So not every lupus patient will have CKD, but then there are some patients who do not respond as well, who may go on to develop CKD or chronic kidney disease. And then also, you know, we may have some patients who have CKD to begin with or a base, you know, they already have chronic kidney disease from some other condition like hypertension or diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we may start seeing signs, you know, uh, of uh, lupus nephritis. So they are the ones who may have lupus nephritis and then have baseline CKD. So that can be like a different scenario. Um, but typically, you know, if we uh, if we diagnose these patients early and uh, reverse inflammation, we can preserve the kidney function. So not every lupus mm -hmm. nephritis patient will develop CKD, but then there are some more aggressive forms of lupus nephritis where the diagnosis is made late, where they not may, they may not recover kidney function, and then they can develop CKD. I see. Well, you hear it here, folks. There's always that 
the chicken or the egg, which came first? Yeah. So take care of your kidney and lupus nephritis. There's a chance that you may not develop chronic kidney disease, but yes. there are many other factors that could lead to the development of chronic kidney disease uh, as well. Okay, so let's go to uh, Katie. She is joining us here from Minnesota. And her question is, can lupus nephritis come out of remission, for lack of a better word? Yes. Hi, Kitty. Yes. You know, thanks for that question. So, yes, you know, um, we, you know, we are basically aiming to get all of our patients into what we call remission. But then, yes, you know, they can go into a relapse or they can come out of, uh, you know, remission. Um, and there can be various factors for that. So, you know, lupus, we know, is a complex disease. There are genetic factors involved and also environmental factors involved. Um, so, at times, you know, we see relapse of the condition and many factors can lead to that. Um, one of them can also be, you know, uh, non-compliance with drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and again, majority of our patients, you know, they work so hard to keep, you know, to stay on track, to keep taking these medicines. But then we also know that there is a huge pill burden. Some of these patients, you know, they need to take 10 to 12 pills, you know, per day uh, to keep, uh, lupus nephritis under control. And, you know, uh, life happens, things happen, you know, they may forget a few doses here and there, there may be some miscommunication, some confusion, or they run out. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, if medications are not taken the way they're prescribed, there can be a relapse. Uh, stress can also lead to relapse, uh, you know, that does play a role. Um, we do advise our patients not to smoke, you know, that's another big factor. Mm -hmm. um, and then, just keeping, you know, uh, um, your, all your appointments, you know, showing up for all your appointments, it's really important because at times we can, you know, uh, catch like a possible relapse early on, and then we can quickly get patients back into remission. But mm -hmm. if the patient doesn't show up and if a relapse, you know, is missed, then it can be very difficult to get these patients back in control. So that's why at least in the initial phase of therapy um, for the first six months or so, you know, we like to be very aggressive with our appointments almost once a month. And then once things go into remission, then we you know we space out the appointments, but yes, mm -hmm. that can happen. We do see relapses. Mm -hmm. I like how you said that uh, it's a huge pill burden. I haven't heard mm -hmm. that phrase before and it's, it's very true. And, yeah, very validating to hear a doctor say that on <laughs> to yes. the community. Yes. Uh, here's another interesting question. You mentioned that one out of every two lupus patients will develop lupus nephritis. Mm -hmm. And Chris is joining us and asks, is there an average time that someone with SLE usually develops nephritis? And again, you know, that's that's an interesting question and a great question, Chris. Thank you for that. So there is really no way to predict, you know, when a lupus patient may develop nephritis. Um, at times we have seen, you know, there's a family history of lupus nephritis or, you know, a history of kidney failure uh, from SLE. Uh, if there's a strong family history, uh, we do worry about, you know, uh, those patients uh, developing lupus nephritis because there is genetic, you know, uh, you know tendency for this disease. Um, but otherwise, it's very difficult to predict when an SLE patient may develop lupus nephritis because half the patients, you know, will not uh, develop mm -hmm. lupus nephritis. Um, so, yeah, so that's why, uh, when uh, SLE patients are seeing their rheumatologists, uh, we have to screen the urine every three months. And that's also part of the guidelines. And that's the only way, you know, we will know that, you know, when they develop kidney involvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that. You know, you mentioned the three primary ways of diagnosing lupus nephritis <laughs> is uh, the urinalysis, the blood tests, and then you talked briefly about the kidney biopsy. Right. Um, there's a lot of fear in the patient community when um, someone is told that they should have, or that the doctor is recommending them to have a kidney biopsy to determine the LN diagnosis. Can you kind of talk us through this process uh, to maybe debunk some myths that we may be having in the patient community about the seriousness and maybe the complications of a kidney biopsy? For sure. Absolutely. So again, you know, I can totally understand, you know, uh, a biopsy 
uh, can be you know a bit scary because you know we are putting a needle here you know in your bag. So, but again, um, this is a day in, in most scenarios it's a day procedure. So it's done either by interventional radiologists or interventional um, nephrologists, and it's done you know it's either CD guided or ultrasound guided. So it's mostly pretty safe. So as you all know, the kidneys, uh, we have two kidneys in the back. Um, so when you do get a kidney biopsy, um, they they don't put you to sleep, but they will give you, you know, something for anxiety or something to calm you down if needed. Um, and they will give you local numbing medication in the back. Uh, then they do the imaging and decide, you know, which kidney to biopsy, left or right. Um, and then they give you the numbing medication and then they go in with the biopsy needle. Uh, typically they take two cores, and you should not feel any pain, just some pressure, you know, from the biopsy needle. And as I mentioned, um, in most scenarios, the biopsy is, you know, an outpatient day procedure, and you're pretty much usually home within four hours or so. Um, they may ask you to keep an eye on the urine because you may uh, see some blood in the urine for 24 hours, mm -hmm. um, and usually it clears up within 24 hours. Um, so again, in most scenarios, the biopsy is extremely safe. Um, there are certain complications, you know, like with any other procedure, like bleeding, you know, an infection. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, it's mostly CT guided or ultrasound guided, and it's, it's extremely safe overall. Um, and in majority of our patients, you know, we really do rely on the biopsy, as I mentioned, to confirm the diagnosis, and then also uh, for prognosis, you know, to see how much scarring we have, because uh, to treat lupus nephritis, we need to use aggressive immunosuppressive medications. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to use medications if we don't think the patients will benefit from these medications mm -hmm. because these are not benign medications. You know, they have side effects. Um, mm -hmm. This suppressed immune system, uh, they can cause complications like infections and malignancies down the lane. So uh, that's the reason why a biopsy is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, in majority of our lupus patients. There are certain scenarios where a biopsy may be contraindicated, you know, for example, if they have one kidney or if they have a certain, you know, disorder where they're more prone to bleeding. So there are certain exceptions we might make um, if the clinical history really fits the picture of lupus nephritis. But in majority of the cases, we do need a kidney biopsy and sometimes mm -hmm. even more than one kidney biopsy because uh, as, you know, I answered the question earlier, there, there can be a relapse. Um, and at times we don't know if it's a true relapse from lupus or if there's something else going on. So if, if you're not sure, we like to do a biopsy to make sure this is still lupus because we don't want to, you know, uh, increase the immunosuppressive medications uh, or expose them to more medications if not needed. Yeah. I think too that there is a kind of a misnomer that a large sample is being taken, like a big Chunk of the kidney is being no. sent off to the lab. No, I, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think that's correct, right, Dr. Kochak? Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, in fact, you know, it's, it's a long needle, but it's a very small core they take, and mostly they limit only to about two cores, of, uh, like, or, or they go in just twice, you know, to get two cores. Uh, at times, mm -hmm. they need to go in a third time, but Typically, we just do two, uh, and it's yeah, it's just you know a small uh, kidney tissue that they're trying to get uh, to look under the microscope so that we can confirm the diagnosis. Yes, yes. yes. Well, thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. Uh, another question that um, I'm sorry, I'm throwing these kind of off the top of my head because I'm just being so um, you're giving so many pearls of wisdom that's making me think of all these other things I want to ask you. You know. It, May is Lupus Awareness Month, but it's also Women's Health Month. And one of the biggest deterrents from, uh, for women and the hardest challenges for women who want to have children and are living with systemic lupus is the fear of their kidneys uh, not being healthy enough or their kidneys being impacted to the point where they would not be able to have a successful pregnancy. Right. We are having a... a a live event about lupus and um, the reproductive system on Tuesday. But as mm -hmm. kind of a teaser to that, I think it might be uh, pretty appropriate just to kind of delve into that since you are a kidney specialist. How can the kidneys be impacted with a pregnancy if someone has systemic lupus and lupus nephritis? Yes. So if patients have lupus nephritis, um, uh, kidney involvement from lupus, 
we really encourage our patients to not get pregnant uh, because, you know, they can have worse outcomes, you know, worse pregnancy outcomes. So we really want these patients to go into remission. And then we will let them know that, you know, yes, you know, at this point, uh, it looks like the inflammation has gone away uh, in the kidneys from lupus. And this might be a safe time uh, to consider pregnancy uh, because a lot of times, um, lupus itself, or I'm, I'm sorry, pregnancy can actually cause a flare uh, of lupus nephritis. So as I mentioned, any stress, you know, any stressor can do that. And pregnancy is also known to, you know, uh, cause a lupus nephritis flare in some of the patients. So that's why we really want these patients to be in complete remission uh, before they contemplate pregnancy. Uh, also, there are certain medications uh, for lupus or lupus nephritis that cannot be used once they are pregnant. So if they get pregnant, then we have to stop some of these medications. And that's really not optimal management, you know, for these patients, because we are really limited uh, what options we have once they are pregnant. So that's why, you know, sometimes we tell them that they should use two forms of contraception while they are on these medications. Let's make sure, let's get your lupus into complete remission. Uh, and then even once you go into complete remission, sometimes, you know, I like to give it a few more weeks, you know, before I tell them, you know, okay, this might be a good time to go ahead um, and, you know, contemplate pregnancy or plan pregnancy, because at that time, we do need to take them off some of the medications. But at that time, it may be safe to do so. Uh, for exam example, Celsept is one of the more common ones that we use. But once mm -hmm. they get pregnant, you know, uh, we like to stop that. And we would rather stop it, you know, when the, they're in remission, because it's overall better for the patient, their kidneys, and for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And if they comply and if they uh, follow through with their labs and kidney checks and um, switching of medications or medication alterations, is it possible for women uh, to have systemic lupus and lupus nephritis and have a healthy pregnancy? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, so if SLE is quiescent, if the kidneys are not involved, then absolutely they can go on to have a healthy pregnancy uh, and great outcomes. In fact, uh, I've had three patients now in the last, I would say, 18 months or two years where they've gone into remission and they've gone on to have successful pregnancies. So, yes, absolutely. Once, mm -hmm. you know, the inflammation has gone away and, you know, your SLE is not active, then absolutely uh, you can have a normal pregnancy. Mm, that's so good to hear. Uh, we have another question about medication, and um, I'll let you use your discretion with answering this. This is regarding IVIG, which has come up quite a bit in our patient communities, uh, regarding it actually being a part of a treatment for lupus nephritis or being in collaboration with other medications. Any thoughts on that? So there, you know, this is an exciting time for um, lupus nephritis because we have multiple options now and safer options. And these options are also now part of the guidelines. Uh, and, you know, without getting into any specifics, uh, in fact, I also counsel my patients, you know, to ask, the, ask their nephrologists, um, are there newer medications out there that they can use? So what I am doing now in our lupus clinic is being more aggressive from the get-go and as soon as we make the diagnosis, we typically start these patients on what we call triple therapy. So we are adding one of these newer agents uh, that are now FDA approved uh, that can be used safely from the get-go. So, uh, you know, even if a patient is moving or, you know, it has to leave our practice for any reason, I tell them that, you know, you make sure wherever you go, you need to ask your nephrologist that, okay, what are the newer options? You know, what else can we do to control the uh, uh, nephritis in the in the kidneys? Mm -hmm. As far as IVIG is concerned, again, some if there's a more serious involvement, Sometimes we may use IVIG, but that's not the standard of care, you know, for lupus nephritis. Um, most of the therapies we have are oral therapies. At times we can use IV medications also in more aggressive forms, but IVIG is still not the standard of care uh, for lupus nephritis. And now we have many more safer options that we can use uh, from, the, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes. And obviously we know that you said this this triple kind of approach of the three different medications and I'm assuming that one of them is more likely than not the use of steroids to kind of get that information that yes. inflammation down as quickly as possible without kidney damage tissue damage occurring 
Yes. Uh, can you kind of talk about that bridge therapy or steroid sparing and what that means? Because yes. so many yes. patients have heard that term and still don't quite understand exactly what the the uh, the, the theory is and why that works. Yes. Yeah, so again, now we know, you know, the push is really to use lower and lower dose of steroids because we know mm -hmm. the steroids, they are just, they, are, they have a lot of side effects. And I know patients don't like to take steroids. Um, so the newer therapies, they allow us to use a lower dose of steroids from the beginning and to do like what we call a quick taper so that we can get these patients off the steroids within six months. You know, earlier, we used to keep our patients on high dose steroids for more than six months, sometimes up to a year, but that practice is really going away. And, you know, if your physician is, you know, starting you off on 60 or 80 milligrams of prednisone, you should really question that. You know, we are really trying to avoid those high doses. Mm -hmm. That's where these new, new therapies come in. So if you're adding these therapies from the beginning, we don't have to use these high doses. What I'm doing is, I'm starting my patients with 20 or 25 milligrams, you know, of prednisone with a quick taper so that by four to six months, these patients can get off the steroids. And I think patients really appreciate that because, you know, they don't like the, uh, you know, the, the adverse effects, the weight gain, uh, the mood changes, you know, it, it's a lot. You, you already are dealing with this serious disease and then you have all these side effects from the steroids. So when I tell them that I'll be adding on another medicine, they're actually okay knowing that they can get off the steroids faster. Uh, so I've seen some great compliance even in my young patients uh, with this triple therapy. So that's what it means, you know, steroid sparing, basically, to get them off steroids faster. Mm -hmm. So by the time the newer medication with the less side effects kicks in, because that takes yeah. a few weeks, sometimes even a month or two, uh, hopefully you can take those steroids down. And that this is just, this is wonderful news to hear you say that you are really trying to have your patients start on a lower dose because yes. for some of us that are pediatric patients who have been on steroids for so long, what um, ends up happening is we, we can't get off of them and it mm -hmm. impacts our adrenal glands and all mm -hmm. those things that, you know, our blood sugar and, and it's just, mm -hmm. oh gosh, to be able to now have these other options, these other yeah. tools in the toolbox, it's just, it makes me feel so optimistic, not just for people right now, but for all the generations in the future. Absolutely. Coming. Yeah, and this is true for, you know, all these different autoimmune conditions and even, you know, for in the transplant world, everywhere, you know, we're trying to cut down on the steroids. So that's really the push, you know, so we're trying to do that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, we have someone, we have Tracy joining, and she's sharing a story about her son who became gravely ill suddenly, suddenly last July. He was hospitalized for 15 days, diagnosed with lupus, systemic lupus, lupus anticoagulant, nephritis, and antifossil lupus syndrome. The doctors were unable to do a kidney biopsy. Here we go. Here's one of those instances, yes. the danger of bleeding. Luckily, he's considered in remission now. Oh, so good to hear that, Tracy. Yes. Uh, well, thanks for sharing that, Tracy, about your son. And I'm so glad he's in remission because uh, we know that males, male patients can, you know, it's not as common as females, but one, you know, in males, they have a more aggressive presentation. So I'm so glad your son is in remission. Uh, and I assume they did go ahead and treat him without a biopsy uh, because a lot of times if the clinical picture fits, you know, uh, and if you cannot do a biopsy, we will still go ahead and start treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like in your case yeah, with your son, it looked like, you know, based on the clinical presentation that, you know, they did go ahead and uh, start treatment. So I'm glad he's doing well. I had a very similar um, case a few weeks ago. Uh, same thing, you know, for the same reason, we could not do a biopsy. And then we uh, all agreed that, you know, the biopsy would not change management. Um, and if the patient was to bleed, you know, uh, from a biopsy, then with this underlying condition, you know, with the antiphospholipid, uh, you know, disease and syndrome, uh, it'll be a bigger challenge to control that bleeding. So we had a very similar case. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, you mentioned kind of earlier on in the presentation about getting your labs checked every three months and sometimes every month. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it's, for patients, it can feel a little just 
daunting to have to keep going and keep doing this. But what is it about that every three months? Like, what is it about that marker that is so important for patients not to miss peeing in a cup? Right. So, you know, as I mentioned that uh, lupus nephritis uh, can be a silent disease. Um, so if we don't check the urine uh, regularly, it could go missed. And then sometimes, you know, when patients present to us, it may be too late. Um, so checking the urine every three months, you know, it helps us to diagnose these patients early on. Um, and sometimes we give uh, urine dipsticks to the patients because, yes, yeah, some patients may, may live far away um, mm -hmm. and it might be difficult to come to clinic. Uh, at times, you know, we ask our patient to get these urine dipsticks and they can do a dipstick on the urine every three or four months. And if they see an abnormal result, because, you know, it gives you, you know, signs uh, for blood and protein. If they start to see any of that, then they will give us a call and then we'll bring them to clinic and do like a full urinalysis. Um, so um, as a nephrologist, um, when they are on active therapy, for the first six months, I check the urine every four to six weeks, and that's to see your response to treatment. But when you're seeing a rheumatologist, and if you don't have kidney involvement, they will check you every three months, and that's also in the guidelines to catch any kidney involvement. So that's why, you know, uh, three to four months, I would say, but yes, you know, we like to keep an eye on the urine on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you just don't want to get yourself into trouble, and, you know, once that kidney damage it happens, it's just better to be on top of it in case anything bubbles to the surface. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned that this is often one of those silent things that just sneaks up and, mm -hmm. and people don't realize because it's not like a kidney infection or UTI where you have pain. Right. What is the number one symptom? I know you mentioned the, the foamy urine. What's the number one thing that you would say to look out for and to be very conscientious of if you have systemic lupus and suspect you may be developing lupus nephritis. Yes. So, yes, it's important because, you know, that's what patients ask us. Sometimes it's a constellation of symptoms. The first thing that the patients may notice, you know, is swelling of their ankles, you know, uh, and they may say that, you know, uh, they're gaining weight and that could be fluid weight. Um, so, because they may not always look at the urine, right, to see, oh, if it's foamy or frothy. Um, but uh, what I hear the most is, yeah, you know, I started seeing swelling in my ankles and I've never had swelling in my ankles. So that's one of the more common complaints or symptoms that the patients notice first. Uh, and then, yes, you know, some patients will mention a foamy or frothy urine, but swelling of the ankles is what we see uh, more commonly uh, and that, that the patients can catch early on. Sometimes, you know, if they're keeping an eye on the blood pressure, they may see a rise in the blood pressure mm -hmm. or if they go to a clinic, you know, and they uh, they tell you that, oh, you know, uh, my physicians have been telling me now my blood pressure is getting high. That's another sign of kidney involvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have high blood pressure, hypertension prior to your systemic lupus and LN mm -hmm. diagnosis, does that make things more complicated? Yes, it does. <laughs> but then what we may see is, you know, if they are well controlled, it may be now harder to control their blood pressure mm -hmm. because uh, once the kidneys get involved, uh, as I mentioned, kidneys do two things. Uh, they clean your toxins, they remove the toxins uh, from the system, and then they also remove the extra fluid. So mm -hmm. if the kidneys get involved, then your kidneys cannot get rid of the extra sodium and the water, and you start to retain fluid and extra sodium and extra salt, and that makes the blood pressure go up. So yeah. the swelling and the high blood pressure, they kind of go hand in hand. So you may notice that, oh, you know, you were well controlled, and now on the same medications, it's been harder to control your blood pressure. Uh, because once you start getting swelling and the fluid accumulation, at that point, a lot of times you need what we call a diuretic uh, or something to help get rid of that extra fluid, uh, like a water pill, you know, as a lot of patients refer that to, and the common one being, you know, Lasix or furosemide. So, yeah, so sometimes, you know, the only way to control blood pressure uh, once the kidneys get involved is using one of the water pills. <clears throat> Oh my gosh, I have, I could talk to you for another hour, but I want to be very <laughs> respectful of your time. I know it's a holiday weekend and you're doing this for us on a Saturday. Um, it just kind of, to kind of cap this up, Dr. Kochar, what's some ways that you can tell your patients to be proactive with their health? Um, we touched a little bit about diet, exercise, lifestyle changes. You mentioned not smoking. Anything else you wanted to add to that? 
So, you know, uh, again, uh, these patients, you know, they do need more time and uh, they, you know, they need to, you need to give them that confidence that yes, you know, uh, we are concerned about their health and we want to work with them to get this under control. Uh, so I think empathy really comes, you know, plays a role here from our side, from the provider side. Uh, because once the patients understand, you know, how serious this condition is and that their provider is willing to, you know, work a lot alongside them to get this under control, um, I think they get more involved and they understand the seriousness of this condition. So, uh, Lupus patients, they do need, you know, uh, at least the initial visits, it, you know, they do need more time. Um, and um, I think it's just important to give them that time because it's the first initial few months that's so important. And what the patients can do is, you know, show up to their appointments, you know, it's just as simple as that. And I know for us, it may be like, you know, we may say, oh, it's easy to show up to your appointments. But at the same time, there can be multiple barriers, you know, as we were discussing transportation or, you know, yeah. childcare or you know, or work mm -hmm. and, or they're in college, you know, they're young. So, uh, you know, for us to understand that there can be barriers and how we can still work with them and make things work. Sometimes we can do, you know, televisits or things of that nature. So I think if the patients understand that, yes, you know, we are willing, uh, you know, we are willing to work alongside them to get this under control and then they do their bit, you know, showing up to their appointments, uh, making sure they get their labs done. Um, and then just, you know, simple healthy lifestyle you know avoid smoking um and exercising staying active um and again do bring a friend or a family member if you can for some of the visits because i think that really helps to have that support um and write down your questions and uh, yes and just track your progress um as mm -hmm. to how much protein you're spilling so a few things to just keep in mind Wonderful. Those are great practical tips. And thank you so much for all of your pearls of wisdom. I, as you were speaking, we're adding names into our drawing for today's Lupus Awareness Month giveaway. Um, we have a lot of people joining from all over the world today. I wish I could ship to Swaziland because we have people joining us from Swaziland, but I cannot, unfortunately. So I'm so sorry, Marcilla. Um, but please, if there's any, any way you know a, a way I could send you something, please let me know. But we have people joining from New York, from Minnesota, from wow. uh, Hawaii, as I mentioned, Swaziland, and all over the U.S. today. So thank you again for taking time to watch this. Uh, we've got Portland here as well. Hello, Anita. And we are going to do a quick drawing. And I also want to remind everyone that this presentation will be up on our YouTube channel in a few days. So anyone who does not have Facebook or Twitter, uh, but you would like to share this incredibly rich and helpful information, this will be available for you to share a link with them. And as uh, Dr. Kochar mentioned, we have our Lupus Lifts program to help remove barriers to care by providing free lift cards for anyone in the Portland metro area to help you get to that um, that test that you can pee in that cup and to help you get your labs done and to help you um, with your follow-up appointments with your nephrologist and rheumatologist. So please message us for any questions regarding our Lupus Lifts program, which is available at morethanlupus.com and on all of our social media outlets. So here we go. I'm gonna spin the wheel here. My fancy, fancy spin the wheel. And it's Tracy, Tracy, I'm so wonderful. I'm so happy that you and your son will get a lupus swag bag sent to you. Please do us a favor and private message us your address and we'll get that out to you early next week. Thank you again to Danny and to Dr. Kochar for Rania Pharmaceutical for sponsoring today's event. Um, and I look forward to working with you again in the future, Dr. Kochar. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you all for joining us today. I really enjoyed this, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend if you're joining us in the U.S. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, don't forget, it might be awkward to pee in a cup, but it is so worth it. You need to stay on top of this. Uh, lupus nephritis is something that is always going to be a topic of conversation for us here at More Than Lupus because it is so important to be aware. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.